Now, we um, talked about Mal Fletcher, and Julie, um, Mal is, how would you describe him? He's a sort of futurologist? Is he's a futurologist, and uh, he's uh, absolutely dynamic, and um, it's just got so much advice and tips for people that want to create future workplaces and uh, better communities in the future. Yeah, listen to him, he's good. Well, let's do that thing right now. Suzanne, she spoke to him earlier because Mal is um, in Norfolk um, this week and he's speaking today, I think, isn't he? Yeah, he's just done a conference at the space uh, earlier on, yes. So a uh, big coup for us. We're delighted that um, Suzanne was able to get hold of him. So have a listen to this. This is Suzanne talking to Mal Fletcher earlier today. This is Business Life on Norwich Today and I'm Suzanne. I'm talking to Mal Fletcher, who's a social futurist from the think tank 2020 Plus. I have to ask you, first of all, what is a social futurist? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, you know, futurism in general is involved with mapping present emerging shifts in things like technology and projecting them forward to suggest how they might further develop in the future. But as a social futurist, my special focus is on tracking all of that and how it will impact on social groups. Now, that includes businesses, governments, uh, civic authorities, community groups, religious groups and more. I'm interested in how rapid change will impact our social ethics and the way we relate to each other. And, you know, in, in business and civic leadership, unless we understand that, we can't really plan for the future. Uh, and our influence and market share are not a product of how we celebrate the past or how we manage the present. But I think as Kodak recently found to its cost, influence is a product of how well we engage the future mm. it happens. Mm. So, so why is it important for leaders and businesses here in Norfolk to take account of future social trends? I mean, there's a tendency, isn't there, to focus on the here and now, particularly in difficult times. Um, you know, the focus is very much on whether it's in health, um, the immediate demands on the health service, or whether it's in business, the immediate demands of business. Why should we look to the future? Well, I, I think you're right. I think every day there are something like five new business books released in the UK and almost none of them take any time at all to look at the social aspect. And yet that's what most impacts the lives of the people who form our clientele, our partnerships, our workforce. Someone once said the only way to predict the future is to create it now. Well, I like to put it this way. If we don't shape the future, someone else's vision of that future will reshape us. Uh, in a sense, technology is not destiny. Our, our future is not a product of new technologies, but how we choose to use mm. them. And so we need to be, as leaders, uh, spending a large part of our time focusing not just on the here and now, which is important, but uh, on developing strategies for engaging future change. If we don't, we're consigning ourselves to irrelevance. Mm. So what would you consider would be the key social trends that we face over the coming years? Um, and, and what sort of impact are they like to have on private businesses and the public sector? Well, that's, that's a great question too, Suzanne. Actually, that's a three-hour question. <laughs> we haven't got three hours. Got <laughs> <laughs> there are many shifts we could talk about, obviously. Um, and when I talk to business and civic leaders, I deal with a number of them. But one of the biggest shifts involves generational change. Yeah. You see that in Norwich, for sure. Mm. The most successful companies today have a 10- to 15-year strategic plan for their products and ideas, but many of them have no plan for how they'll engage the generation who will have to carry those strategies on their shoulders. Sure. Um, um, and over the next 10 to 15 years, the so-called millennial generation, they're today aged around 30 and under, will come into positions of real power in industry and civic life. And we need to be looking now at how they might want to reshape what we're doing in line with their generational personality. Mm. So it's a really very much about investing in the next generation, isn't it? Yeah, and understanding their characteristics. Mm. I mean, one of the things about millennials that most of us don't realise is that they tend to be more civic-minded than we baby boomers or, or generation. Really? Yes. They, when they come together, the research suggests they don't simply do so to form friendships. They do so to very often create activity, some of which takes the form of activism. Um, and so they're much more inclined to want to be more than consumers. They aspire to be activists even in the way they spend their money. That's where free trade coffee came from, for example. Mm. So if we're going to engage that generation, we have to develop a more activist approach within business uh, and our business model. We have to identify ways to promote or support causes, either directly or indirectly, within the business model. Well, so that must present some sort of challenges, but also some opportunities for business leaders. I mean, to try and have that activism in a business how, how, how can businesses achieve that? Well, it is a challenge. Um, it may be as simple uh, as 
ensuring that in the culture of the of the business there is a celebration of volunteering among the staff. Sure. Some businesses do that quite actively, others do it more indirectly. But I think the fundamental role of a leader in business or civic life is as a cultural architect. Uh, leaders, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, leaders essentially um, uh, map out a vision, they draw up a strategy, and then they marshal activity to create an environment in which people can be confident to invent and take risks. Um, in my address to Norwich leaders this week, I'm talking about the fact that uh, entrepreneurial people need to feel the system is both stable, but it also welcomes risk-taking, it welcomes inventive thinking. I think Norwich is actually very well placed to develop as an innovation hub over the next 10 or 15 years if we can adopt that sort of big-picture leadership, leadership that looks beyond our own corporate or political front door and takes the long view. So what would you say, I mean, what are the key messages to business leaders and civic leaders here, uh, here and now? What can they do to sort of future-proof themselves almost? Well, I, I think... You know, obviously one can't future-proof anything. The future is by <laughs> definition unknowable. But um, if it was predictable, it wouldn't be the future. It would be something else. We'd all be lottery winners. <laughs> exactly. We'd all, we wouldn't be here talking right now. We'd be in the Bahamas somewhere. Lovely. <laughs> we can't definitively predict the future, Suzanne, but we can, uh, you know, draw a line from the past, if you like, through the present into what might be the future based on the available research and information. And one thing we can do right now to prepare for the future is to establish an innovation culture within our own enterprises um, and as I said we've conducted a lot of research on this and essentially there are many things I'll be talking this week about in Norwich uh, in terms of developing that innovation culture but essentially it is an aspect it is a matter of leadership it's a matter of leadership creating the confidence in uh, our individual enterprises for people to be inventive and take risks yeah that's quite that's quite a, a cultural change in businesses i'm thinking of the public sector and i'm thinking of businesses because there is risk taking is is difficult because there's a there's a blame culture in the many of uh, of businesses you know people are looking to whether the consumer might um, take legal action and that cramps risk taking doesn't it yes indeed it does and uh that legal culture today is something of a problem at times, but I still think we can overcome that. I think if, if we ask the right questions, we get the right answers. For example, I think one of the most important questions any leader can ask in any sector of society is this, what kind of city do my customers, my clients, mm. uh, my partners want to live in 10 years from now? What can I do now to set that in motion? Mm. So it's not just about growing the business, it's about improving life for people. Mm. Uh, I like to think that no matter what we have you know, on the bottom line in, in the books, uh, a business really doesn't have value unless it adds value. Mm. And that kind of leadership that looks beyond our own corporate... This sort of visionary leadership you're It talking. is visionary leadership, but it's visionary leadership that doesn't just dream. It mm. takes vision and, and applies it to strategic thinking. That's important. Mm. So um, where can people go for more information on this and get some help and advice? Because, um, you know, it is difficult for businesses to think ahead, particularly when it's difficult and they've got immediate problems facing them how can they get out of that and and get some input to to help them well we we offer a range of resources for leaders who want to become more proactive about that um in particular i love presenting the benefits of all of our research in an entertaining way to <laughs> business and civic leaders through our 2020 plus leadership events and also events run by individual companies and civic groups. Um, I also do a lot of comment in the media, as I am right <laughs> now, about issues relating to social change and how it impacts leadership. People can find out a lot more about that, Suzanne, through our website, yeah. 2020 Plus. That's the number 2020, the word plus, P-L-U-S, dot net. And you've got a new book out as well. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about specific change and how it is affecting social relationships and businesses. It's called Fascinating Times. We've already had some great feedback from leaders uh, who say it's helping them get a handle on where we might be going. It's available on Amazon Kindle, but you don't have to have a Kindle to use it. You can read it on almost any digital device, or you can get it via our website, again, 2020plus.net. <laughs> Well, thank you very much indeed for talking to Future Radio. Future Radio 107.8. Radio that does different.